How well does your company bridge competence and confidence? How does that bridge transform your executive leadership? Leadership that creates a positive work culture that drives results. My guest on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast has the blueprint and skills to build this bridge. She does it daily as she leads an amazing team of nearly 2,000 staff to produce Freightliner M2 and SD Plus medium duty trucks as the general manager of the Daimler Truck North America plant in Mount Holly. Let's discover right now how you can develop your workforce through a relevant digital transformation that transitions product and service portfolios to more sustainable solutions on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Welcome to the Work Positive Podcast with your host, executive coach and culture architect, Dr. Joey Fawcett. Discover strategies and tactics that work positive as Dr. Joey talks with industry leaders who create a positive work culture that attracts top talent and reduces team turnover. Discover how you can create a work positive culture that increases productivity and profits. Here's your host, Dr. Joey. Work Positive Nation, help me welcome to this episode of the Work Positive Podcast, someone whom you will very shortly admire and want to be when you grow up. Here is the Joanna Cooper. Joanna, welcome to the Work Positive Podcast. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today. Oh, I am so excited to have you here because the company to which you belong is the largest truck manufacturer on the planet, right? Yep. Daimler yeah. Truck is the, the largest OEM on the planet. Right. And you are general manager of how many people at the Mount Holly, North Carolina plant? Right now we have just over 1,700 people that are sitting at our facility building medium duty trucks. Wow. Now give us an idea of what a medium duty truck is because we're not talking 150s or 250s or anything here. We're talking about something a little (laughs) bit larger than that, right? Right. I mean, we're fortunate to to work for a company that has a purpose for all who keep the world moving. Mm -hmm. And so we build products that enable just the world to do things. So a lot of our trucks become cement mixers. Altec is one of our largest uh, customers, at least here in Mount Holly. And if you'll see those trucks when the power goes out, Mm -hmm. you you have the street sweepers, right? Most of our trucks go to some of the best customers that enable like all that we rely on a day-to-day basis. Wow. Well, thanks for making those power company trucks because when the power goes out, (laughs) we want trucks. We've been doing that a lot in certain places. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Have you ever in your life? uh, Yeah. We can have another conversation about solar panels and batteries, can we? But (laughs) anyway, and trucks are, are an amazing thing that I think many people take for granted. I mean, do you Absolutely. even think about how the cement gets to that new home that's being built to pour the footings and the Absolutely. dependability that truck has to have? And so those trucks are rolling right off of your production line right there in Mount yeah. Holly, North Carolina, aren't they? Yeah. All those Amazon packages have to get across sometimes the country, sometimes across the city. And there, are, there are a lot of use applications for what trucks do. And and it's an inspiring business to be in. I can honestly say that. Yeah. So you've been seeing things built since you were a little girl, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. My dad worked at Chrysler uh, for 35 years. I came out of the city of Detroit, Motor City. So that's just kind of in your blood. Yeah. So how did you decide to become in this role that you are now? I mean, did you set out as a little girl and say, I want to build cars like my daddy? Oh, absolutely not. I think as a (laughs) little girl, at one point I wanted to be a scientist. I really liked chemistry. Uh And I said, and I can balance chemical equations really well. So I Mm. said, maybe I can go work for the military and be a bomb maker. (laughs) (laughs) And blow trucks up, right? (laughs) (laughs) But when I went to college, I also played Division I basketball and being good at numbers, I ended up majoring in finance, which was good for me. And 
I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'm a millennial. So we were a little bit of a different breed coming out of school. So I wanted to be an entrepreneur and do real estate and invest and things like that. And my best friend and I, we partnered together and crashed and burned very quickly, which is probably for the best. Well, I'm glad it was um, quickly. <laughs> a slow yeah, death is too. worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm glad it was actually quickly. It didn't feel good at the time, but it was good in hindsight. And uh, a recruiter called me one day while I was just looking for my next thing. And the position was at Detroit Diesel, which actually was five minutes from where I grew up. Didn't know. Oh, my, wow. my dad worked at Chrysler, not at the not at the engine, heavy duty engine facility right around the corner. Mm-hmm. And I started my career there in purchasing and, mm-hmm. and just continued over the course of the first half of my career to say yes to a lot of different opportunities. I did an expat assignment. I had the opportunity to do that Mm -hmm. and lived in Germany for three years, returned to Detroit and did a role where I I was working on the project management side, but I was in the plant, like really in the plant more Mm -hmm. than I was just at my desk. And I caught the manufacturing bug (laughs) and pivoted there. And then that's Uh how I made my way to where I am today. Oh, I love it. Okay, if you played D1 basketball, you got to give a shout out to, for your team. Where did you play? Yeah, University of Detroit Mercy, oh, Lady Titans. Lady Titans. All right, go Lady Titans. That's amazing. Yeah. And by the way, parenthetically, I love seeing the rise of the WNBA now. The oh, ladies absolutely. have been playing but far too those long. Those ladies have been awesome forever. They the really world is now just catching up to the WNBA, but those girls have always been playing some basketball. I can That's tell you that I'm much. They got skills. They really do. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to play against them. I can you that. <laughs> Even in my younger days, I don't want to play against them. So you caught that manufacturing bug. What was that like for you? It was the blend of, I think, personality and position. So within our organization, we take the DISC assessment. I had also taken Strength Finder. You had Myers-Briggs, but the DISC, when I took that, it resonated. And it was a while back. Mm-hmm. And I think we oftentimes are looking for that thing that makes us feel like we're at home. I felt like in the plan, on the shop floor, like even in the dynamics of what it is that we do, that I had the opportunity to show up as my whole self and not parts of myself, right? So it was just, like I said, the the blend of position as well as, right, purpose and fit. Uh, Position, purpose, and fit. Oh, that's a great recipe for anybody who's looking to help people find their authentic selves along the way. So how comfortable are you sharing with us what your high score was in the DISC? Oh, I am a high D in my natural state and my adaptive state. The only thing that was my first test. So nothing else was over the line. So I'm one of those people. Right. And then as it has, as I've progressed over the years, I'm still a high D, but my C has gone up. So I try to leverage the C uh, to depress my D, but I am not an I. (laughs) 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 Uh, and i'm a very low s so i I am a high d low s i got you yeah wow well since you were authentic i'll be authentic too very high d on my side like off the chart d but man i'm so weird uh uh, and it's okay i'm comfortable in my weirdness (laughs) i'm a high i also so i've got this very that yeah, I got this very high D and then I got this high I that's almost very high. So yeah, uh, if I start talking to myself, just know that there's those two parts of myself that are, that are trying to figure all this out. So yeah, and there's so many great tools like that that help us discover our mm-hmm. authentic selves. And you, as the general manager of the Daimler uh, truck plant there in Mount Holly, you guys are cranking out thousands and thousands of trucks every day. You're in charge of supervising right a staff of 1700 persons right Mm -hmm. now of course you've got people to help you with that how do you because we're all struggling with this area today i think how do you attract top talent to come to work for you that's a very good question because 
I'm looking at talent in two different ways. I'm looking at talent to fill like STEM positions or to become supervisors or facilities engineers, manufacturing engineers, IT. But then we are also trying to attract talent to to build trucks because those are the, the people that we rely on to do what we need to do. And I will say that it hasn't necessarily been the same as what people remember. My organization has transformed significantly past COVID. We've had a number of higher seniority people that have retired and gone on into the next phase of their life, but it drastically shifted like really fast to people that don't have as much seniority. We're talking about five years or less. So many of these people that we hire on the, the blue collar side, people come in and some have experience mechanically, but others don't because Mm. as manufacturing has shifted and you have ergonomic accommodations, processes are safer, just product is a little bit different. Now you have significantly more women or significantly different skill set of people. And let's be clear, a lot of people don't have shop class anymore. They don't know tools or... <laughs> yeah, right. No, they, they, can or, they read a tape measure is a question I hear from our GC friends. Right. All right. So part of attracting one is where do you go to attract? So we, we try to partner with schools that have programs that, that help to at least provide students with this baseline skill. We... I try to be as visual as possible and my team members try to be as visual as possible on LinkedIn and the places where people are that are trying to look for employment to say, hey, this is a great place to work. Partner with the community has also been a good resource because then there is the synergy and commitment to to forwarding the community, the surrounding community. Uh, But there isn't one simple recipe as far as attracting talent, honestly, because you're talking about a lot of different types of work when you're Talking about engineers, we have a a very good internship program where you can provide students with an opportunity to get work experience, but then also see if this is a fit for them. We have a number. I actually have a young man that's starting with us in a a couple of months that did a couple of years of internships, did a phenomenal job, and now he's joining us as a permanent team member in the summertime. So it it becomes very dynamic when you're talking about where you're hiring and what you're trying to attract and and for what types of roles, especially when you're talking about a manufacturing facility. Mm, And and your needs are so multifaceted there because you've got people that you need on the line, and then you've got an engineer like... Well, being in North Carolina, North Carolina State University, right? So you right. go Wolfpack. I'll just say that. Not that <laughs> I did doctoral work there or anything. <laughs> but you've got those uh, mm-hmm. you know, women and men coming into those engineering programs there. So you can, in effect, audition them, right? During these internships. Correct. Yeah, and they can audition you too and see what kind of culture. That Absolutely. You have that you have there. Absolutely. So manufacturing, you mentioned change. I hear you talking about passing of the torch, as it were, from long tenured employees to those with five years or less. In that gap and during that transition, COVID exacerbated the whole thing, but already we were seeing the influence and impact of automation on manufacturing today. How has that impacted the way that you seek to attract top talent? I think in our business, there is automation that helps us from a digital perspective to improve feedback loops and things like that. But some of our work is still just hard, right? You're talking about bringing two two rails together, bolting them together, right? You have a lot of intricacies when it comes to right the technology that is now assembled in our truck to enable safety systems, but the work is still very hard. It's not like a passenger car plant where you see all these robots and machines, right? We are, our work is really enabled, right, by the people that we employ. Mm, yeah. How can't pick up those huge rails to put that concrete truck together? Yeah, we have a tool to pick up the big rail to put them down, right. but somebody still has to do the work to, to put them together and you still yeah. have to swing the engine. So we have a lot of implements and hoist and lift fixtures. About 40% of my population is women. We have a lot of, we've made a lot of ergonomic improvements with technology over the years to enable a more diverse workforce. So that is really exciting to see. 
Oh, it must be. Now, those persons who've chosen to retire after a 25 or 30 year career, mm -hmm. they didn't come along with that many females in the workplace, did they? So what kind of dynamics did that create in terms of attracting top talent? I think women can have really have a place in manufacturing. I'm part of the board of women in manufacturing and mm -hmm. The men are actually very inviting. They're welcoming. Right? It, it hasn't created any type of conflict. If anything, it's created more colorful. <laughs> I hear I what you're not saying. saying. More, yeah. more, more of a, a colorful canvas of things that can go on in, uh -huh. in the plant. But, Just like women play basketball and they've mm -hmm. been playing for their whole lives. Like we talked about the WNBA. Right. Uh, women can do work too. Right? And it's a, some pretty cool and amazing women that, 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 work, that work here day to day. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I celebrate that 40%. Is a higher number than I would have expected. So I celebrate that with you, Joanna, and it's got to be a part of a tribute to your amazing ability to lead that plant there and, and to be able to embrace that. So you're going out there and you're looking for different types of top talent, some to be on the floor and in the manufacturing space, others to be your engineers. So let's say that I, I come to work for you. Mm -hmm. What happens then? as it come to work for you, particularly looking at attrition and team turnover and trying to reduce that. What kinds of, what's your secret in the sauce there? So what we've had to do differently since our workforce has changed and our demographic is different, our generations are different, mm -hmm. is add more elements to our new hire onboarding. So regardless if you're starting in the office or you're starting in the manufacturing floor, I think that the first 60 to 90 days are integral for retention. That is the only, that's as much time as you get to capture the passion coming in the door and transition it to someone that wants to see themselves there sustainably. And that's not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. but starting out with your onboarding is really important. So like I try to join as many onboarding sessions as I can for 10 to 15 minutes just to talk about the high level strategy, the purpose of the company and orient them just like we talked about what it is that we get to do every day. And I explain to them what my expectations are, right? Safety first and foremost, we want them to go home better than they came. That's what we say in our envisioned future. Good. Meaning I said, I want you to have both your eyes, all 10 fingers, all 10 toes. So don't take shortcuts. <laughs> hey, we have systems in place and just be present. Let them see that I am a person, not just a figure mm. in a seat, right? Mm. So that they, that's probably one of the few times that they would get for that long of a time just to sit, just because I'm walking around, I'm doing gimbas and things like that, mm. but just to set the tone mm. and then adding additional days of training to not just put them on the floor, but to take them through, hey, these are our systems. These are our tools, mm -hmm. right? Let them feel what it feels like to use a hoist or an impact gun and things. And actually, sometimes people say, you know what, this isn't for me, right? But I'm glad that they make that decision within 60 days and not 360 days because that's a much different process. Yeah. And I think the same is the, the case for if you're hiring so do you, can you explain to somebody what their role and responsibility is, right? Mm -hmm. Do they know what the expectations are? Do, can you define for them what the next few weeks are going to look like so they can mm -hmm. be prepared mm -hmm. so that you can help them through that journey? I think that that's really important. Mm -hmm. So you're anticipating certain mile markers along the way and answering those questions before they actually can come up in the reality of the floor. Yeah. And, Maybe it's because I was an athlete, right? And I think about sports, right? You give them a playbook. Like that doesn't mean that there, there's not going to be offense and defense and things that happen. But sure. the best teams that I played for had coaches that set clear expectations mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. and could define what success looks like. Yeah, I'm reminded of North Carolina State's famous coach, Jim Valvano, who began mm -hmm. the first day of practice by bringing the ladder in and scissors and had his players climbing up to cut the nets. 
there, there's a definition of success that we're winning yeah. championships and we can do that. So that's amazing. I love the way, particularly that you as the GM of 1700 people get into those onboarding training sessions to be present so they can hear from you as opposed to, as you said, just be in the seat somewhere far removed. Yeah. That's amazing, Joanna. Joanna Cooper is my guest on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. She is the general manager of the Daimler Truck North American plant located in Mount Holly, North Carolina. And that's probably one of the reasons I keep mentioning NC State, right? <laughs> you got me in a right, North Carolina. Back, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, let's just say that I've taught my four-year-old granddaughter how to howl like a wolf. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But she loves it. She loves it. So you've got you've attracted this amazing top talent in, in these diverse positions. You're doing the right things to reduce team turnover. So they're working with you and for you, Joanna. How do you measure your culture as it continues to mature with these new hires? So I think there's two ways. One, we do take employee engagement surveys at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. Hmm. And recently we switched from like the great place to work survey to engage. And what engage enabled us to do was have not just click the box, how much do you agree or disagree, but employees can land comments, can actually type in comments. Wow. And the comments give you a lot of context to the employee experience, mm. right? So what I would say though, is like every year, this is like the third year we've done Engage, the scores have changed mm -hmm. depending on the, the surrounding environment, sometimes there's a little bit of nuance for just what's going on in the world versus versus oh, something yeah. else. And yeah. it's different, but it, it tells mm. us that people are paying attention and mm. it tells us that people want a voice. It's just how do we un interpret that and drive it? And so mm. last year we did our surveys. We had our scores. I had focus groups and I uh, did listening sessions and, mm -hmm. and got some clear mm -hmm. themes to work on. And we That's worked true. on those scores and we worked on those themes that we got from the people. Mm. And then we took the survey again this year and the scores didn't get better. <laughs> got <laughs> oh, worse. goodness. So, and, and, the, because the, and so I had to take a step back and ask myself, well, why is that? Mm. And what I've deuced, or at least what I've been sitting with and how we've tried to transform how we get feedback this year is mm -hmm. what we ask is 1,700 people to say, get, tell me what everything, what, what's wrong, right? And uh, then try to determine what the themes are to work on. And then we pick two or three because you can't work on 50, Sure. right? But you're talking about the funnel of need coming down to a very few number of people and the impact mm. or the changes that we make are oftentimes at a snail's pace. Yeah. So while we're working on good things, while we're working on the things that matter to them, it doesn't impact them as much because they don't see the result because it's moving so slow. So it's like mm. you looking at something and you say, is it moving? Like that's pretty much how they feel, right? Yeah, it's creeping. <laughs> Have you ever seen something like a like a train that's actually creeping and you can't tell if it's moving or still uh -huh. because it's it's like going so slow? I, I, that's their experience. And so this year, what we are are doing is okay. How do we? And we've asked ourselves like, how do we use our huddle meetings? How do we use the regular cadences and the regular impact and technology? Because more than half of my population use their cell phone all the time. Wow. Right. And give them an opportunity to give real time feedback on a regular basis, but not just tell me what all the things that are wrong. You've told me that in the survey and I've used chat GPT to figure out what you said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. To right? Analyze but it. Tell me how we can be better and how I can enable you to do something to make your experience better. And I think that with helps to improve the culture. So how you measure that, the more things that the team is doing on their own to make their life better. The mm. engage, the survey is the lagging measure. What I want to see is the activity of team members, variety of team members across all the different teams that, mm -hmm. that say, hey, I want to make this better and this is what I want to do within my team. Oh, wow. So they're taking personal ownership of the process. And take there. personal ownership. You yeah. have to. It's not sustainable otherwise. You're going to, 
it's going to be the same thing every year. You're going to get feedback. You're going to pick three things and the results are not going to drastically change. Mm-mm, mm-mm. It's going to seem microscopic when you want it to be telescopic. You really want to mm-hmm. drive the change faster. And by empowering everyone to be a part of the solution, that becomes sustainable at that point. So yeah. if I may, what are some of these challenges that you're discovering? As far as navigating the process or... <laughs> oh, yeah, not so much the process, culture. but what, what's going on in the culture there? Mm-hmm. The, the generational divide of this is how it's always been and recognizing how small that number is in relation to the new people that are here. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you start to lose a lot of people that have been working together for a long time, you can really see how much tribal knowledge is there versus... Mm-hmm things that were actually written down because they had been doing the job for so long. And 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 when these nuances happen, I don't need to jot that down. I know what it is. Well, now more than 50% of the population don't know what it is. It's not necessarily a part of, of the standard. And so the generations that have been here the longest are sometimes the loudest, but the population that I need to for that longevity and that sustainability are the ones that I, I want to speak up. And they have to be able to understand each other. Mm. So bridging that generational divide across all of the various age groups is definitely a challenge, but really important for success. So how do you give a voice to those who are quiet? Surveys. Okay. Like Slido, you know, anything that you can develop where people can just give quick feedback. We okay. de- We launched a communication app where we can put more information out because it's a lot coming at you. So Uh it's framing it in a way where there are quick answers and people can vote and then you can consolidate, you can digest, Mm. you can ask the next next question as quickly as possible to keep them engaged Mm. and then defining the forum to engage them in. Mm -hmm to have those regular conversations. And it's not just with their phones, it's also with their supervisor or their team leader in their Uh, huddles. Like, all right, mm -hmm. hey guys, this was the result. What do you think about this? And then, right, and really start the conversation around, all right, how can we make this better? Oh, there it is. There's the gold. So the the surveys and all over the conversation starters, it's in the huddles and places like that and team meetings where you say, okay, how can we make this better? And that's the generative part of the whole process to create a positive work culture. And what technology then helps us do is say, instead of using pen and paper and somebody take notes and write it down, then you have to transcribe those notes and then somebody has to put it on a PowerPoint. We can use tools (laughs) like Slido and any of those, you know, Mentimeter, any of those things to do it for us. Yeah, and to get the information Collect back faster so those conversations Absolutely. can start, so behaviors can begin to change, so the culture improves. Right. And that's going to move the needle on the engaged surveys that you're taking every year. It's going to move the, it faster. That is the hypothesis. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Well, and we hear this from so many persons like yourself, Joanna Cooper, that it's this multi-generational approach and the loss of that tribal wisdom, Right here's how we roll, but we didn't codify it. We didn't make it accessible to Mm -hmm. persons other than those who loved working here and stayed here for 25 years. So how do we pass that knowledge on that way we roll onto the next gen? That's incredibly helpful. And you've given us something very specific to do. So I always appreciate that. Speaking of which, Joanna Cooper, who is the general manager of the Dymo Truck North America plant in Mount Holly, North Carolina, oversees the amazing creation of thousands and thousands and thousands of trucks every year that are bringing you concrete that are keeping the lights on for you in all sorts of ways in which your world is made better. I always like to ask my guest, Joanna, one thing, because Work Positive Nation is always interested in one thing. We're all looking for one thing we can do today. I can't move the mountain all at once, but I can take a shovel and begin digging. So what's your one thing, Joanna Cooper, that you would recommend to Work Positive Nation that they could start doing today to create a positive work culture? Be a trailblazer. Work culture is changing faster than we can change with it. So how can you be on the forefront of teaching organizations how to 
change faster. I love it. Empowering change. And that's the sustainable solutions that you're doing right there at the planet, Mount Holly. Joanna, I have learned so much from you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spending time with us, taking time away from the rolling, rolling, rolling that's going on there in, in your truck plant. And we are just so grateful for this time together. I'm smarter, I'm better. I know Work Positive Nation is too. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. And I appreciate talking to you. It's been a wonderful conversation, Dr. Joey. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Please share this podcast with your friends who are HR and small business leaders so they can do one thing today to create a positive work culture that increases productivity and profits. I'd like to give you a free Work Positive course just for listening. It's called Something to Talk About, and it's transformed the work conversations of so many people all over the world. Get your free copy when you go to workpositive.today slash something to talk about, and you can start transforming your conversations today. Remember, it pays to work positive.